When did Georgetown first begin admitting women? Enrollment records indicate the year was 1880, the same year Healy Hall was completed. That year, Jeanette J. Sumner and Annie E. Rice enrolled in the medical school. When the university archivist mentioned them a few years ago, I wondered about their backstory. Why did they stay only one year at Georgetown before transferring? They opened a clinic in DC after graduating. Was it a success? What is the legacy of their work today? Dr. Sumner and Dr. Rice were friends who blazed trails together, both at Georgetown for women students and in the practice of medicine in the nation's capital. It's no surprise that the path wasn't easy, but as it turns out, it also impacted their health in profound ways. Through census records, journal articles, patent records, books, and old DC newspaper clippings, we can learn a little more about these two remarkable women. Let this short film serve as an introduction to these visionary doctors and as an invitation to keep digging because it's clear that there's more to the story. Jeanette Judson Sumner was born in 1846 in Constantine, Michigan. Her father, Watson Sumner of Massachusetts, was the town doctor. Her mother, Hester Ann Welling, was from Baltimore originally. She had an older sister who died as a toddler and an older brother, George, who she lived with again later when they were adults. Her father died just a year after she was born. Property rights for women were weak at the time, so her widowed mother likely faced financial hardship. Census records suggest Jeanette lived some of her childhood years in Wisconsin with relatives, but in her 20s lived with her mother, brother, and his wife in Brooklyn, New York. Her brother became a rear admiral in the Navy, and by 1880, Jeanette moved to Washington, D.C. to live with him and his growing family in this home just off present-day Logan Circle. Annie Elmira Rice was born in Hallowell, Maine in 1854. Her family was in the whaling business and her father was the first American consul to Japan. Her family traveled there with some frequency in her youth. Her mother, Elmira W. Sampson, and her father, Alicia E. Rice, had three children, Annie the youngest and her two older brothers, Nathan, a physician in Illinois, and George, who eventually became the second consul to Japan and raised his family there. Annie suffered from some kind of heart ailment throughout her life. We don't know how Annie and Jeanette, or Nettie as she was sometimes called, became friends. Annie was 12 years younger than Jeanette. They both attended a science experiment conducted by Alexander Graham Bell in 1880 and wrote letters filed at the patent office attesting to their witness of his invention known as the photophone. They were ambitious, well-connected women Jeanette was a cousin of the famed abolitionist senator from Massachusetts, Charles W. Sumner. Annie's mother regularly entertained, as reported in the social columns of local papers. Perhaps they knew Georgetown's president at the time, Jesuit scholar and visionary Patrick Healy. His parents, an Irish father and former enslaved black mother, were committed to educating both their sons and daughters. This value may have led to his willingness to admit women to the university. Healy ran ads in the local paper to try and recruit students to the financially struggling enterprise of the medical department. Money may have been the prime motivator to recruit women, but at least he was unafraid to put the possibility into action. Our two aspiring physician women were unafraid to break down barriers and decided to enroll together at the all-male medical department at Georgetown in 1880. Classes were held in the evening at a somewhat dilapidated building downtown at 10th and East Streets Northwest. According to newspaper articles, neighbors complained about the unclean and poorly maintained anatomy lab, for example. Georgetown took over the space from another medical school called Columbian, which today is George Washington University. Georgetown's medical program had fewer than 50 students total in the three-year course. Likely, the educational environment for Jeanette and Annie was not ideal because for whatever reason, after one year, they transferred to the prestigious Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania, located in Philadelphia. The rigorous curriculum required all graduates to publish theses. Theirs were on uterine disease and women's health. Students came from around the world and alumni went on to establish clinics or lead medical education institutions in their home states and countries. Dr. Rice and Dr. Sumner returned to D.C. and opened a free clinic for women by women doctors, a wildly new concept in the nation's capital at the time. 
They were determined to offer patient-centered care for women that women physicians could uniquely provide. They hustled for space and funding and even wrote a letter to the head of Georgetown's medical school asking for medical equipment and furnishings from a dispensary the university had decided to close. They invited several Georgetown and Columbian professors to be part of the consulting board and had a long list of men and women offering financial and administrative support for the venture. They also got funding from the federal government. Weeks later, they opened the Women's Dispensary, a free clinic at 937 New York Avenue, primarily serving women of color. The physicians saw paying patients in their own practice across the street in the mornings and evenings and operated the clinic every day from noon to three. They treated 1,000 patients in their first year in a city with a population of around 130,000 at the time. Unfortunately, just less than a year after opening the clinic in January of 1884, Dr. Rice succumbed to exhaustion and died. Just days before, she willed all of her inheritance and their shared clinic property over to her friend and partner, Dr. Sumner. The setback must have been tough, losing her friend and business partner, but Dr. Sumner managed to keep the clinic operating another 12 years, training a new generation of women clinicians and caring for thousands of women and their families in DC. For the first three years, she was the only attending physician. She eventually brought in fellow Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania alum, Ida Heiberger. Financial pressure and the increased demand for training medical students at Georgetown forced Dr. Sumner to take on some male doctors and students. Dr. Heiberger left after a year, likely frustrated with the change, and went on to start the successful women's clinic based on the same principle of women doctors treating women patients. Sumner's Women's Dispensary moved to a new, larger location in Southwest DC at Maryland Avenue and Four and a Half Streets, near where the Air and Space Museum stands today. By 1890, they had strayed dramatically from the original mission, with patients increasingly getting surgical procedures and predominantly male student trainees and observers. The shift may have been disheartening for Dr. Sumner. Census records from 1900 show her living at St. Elizabeth's, the government hospital for the insane. She was admitted there in 1896 and spent the last 10 years of her life there, dying in 1906. Her patient record is on file at the National Archives, currently closed to the public due to the pandemic. But a helpful librarian there took a peek and said it's over 100 pages long and includes documents from the last 10 years of her life, including letters and clinical notes. Did she check herself in? Was she brought there? Why? How was she treated? Who visited her? Did she try to leave? Dr. Jeanette J. Sumner is buried in an unmarked grave in DC's Rock Creek Cemetery, just steps from her friend and fellow Hoya, Dr. Annie E. Rice. As the first women to enroll at Georgetown, their legacy deserves more attention and research, and perhaps some commemorative space on campus. Today, we all benefit from the heavy doors these brave, visionary doctors opened during a transformative chapter in our city and campus, and for women in medicine. Thank you.